Right, welcome everybody to week two, day one, two o'clock section. I'm going to do a slightly different lecture than the 12 o'clock section. I'm going to upload both of them. So this one is going to be a solution to the Zeta assignment in a bottom-up format, solution format. Um, the, real, the real trick with Zeta is how to break down the problem, because you got three, four loops calling each other, and that hurts the human brain like beyond a certain level of complexity like your brain starts locking up and you need to sort of systematically um, make things in a deliberate fashion and, and break the problems into pieces and solve the pieces and and use those to solve other parts of the problem and you have to kind of work your way up there's a that, that's why I said when I give you Zeta it's like nothing nothing in this required anything more than like halfway through CSI 40 uh, four loops function calls yeah that's about it um, if statements um, but because it's a loop within a loop within a loop, that level of complexity hurt people's brains. They had trouble doing it. So about a third of the students turned into zero on this assignment. Something like that. So um, there's no reason to get a zero on this assignment. Like there were there were some really easy point pickups on it. Uh, if you do the error checking, uh, there was like a couple points just to make sure that the input was like okay. There's like three points for that, which. It's pretty pretty easy, um, and you know it gets progressively harder as you get towards twelve, right? Uh, even Min Crowley only got eleven out of twelve. Um, uh, his his solution was good; it just ran out of stack space. So he did a recursive function, and it recursed too many times. He went he delved too deep, and uh, uncovered the Baylor, and the Baylor ate him. So. Uh, uh, you can't hear me? Uh, can you guys hear me? Hello? 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 Okay. So I'm going to solve Zeta in this section a different way than I solved it in the previous section. And so I'm going to post both recordings and you can see which approach you like better. Okay. So let's, let's do this. Um, log in on the server. There we go. And let's go. So, welcome to um, welcome to Zeta. Uh, no vector, no algorithm. I'll use read.h. Okay. So in the previous in the previous class, I did what's called top-down programming, which means you start in main and you work your way down a level at a time. And if there's a function that you need that you haven't written yet, you stub it out. You write a dummy function. Is that a prime? Yes. Right. That's top-down programming. Everything's a prime, you know, and but you can use that to write your prime counting function. Count how many primes there are, you know, and you can use the prime counting function. Yeah. So we're going to do it the other way. We're going to start at the bottom level. The bottom level is determining if a number is prime or not, and we're going to work our way up. So in this section, we are going to do what's called the bottom, bottom, bottom up coding. And so for this one, we're going to use drivers. Drivers uh, are uh, functions that test low level code. All right. Uh, in the previous class, we use stubs. A stub, sub, a stub is a mock function that returns a fake but plausible result. All right. So for the prime counting function, when I stubbed it out, it just returned, you know, yes for everything or, or whatever, you know. Okay, so um, so we're gonna do bottom up coding this time. So I mean, start with the lowest level, the lowest, most fundamental function, and work up to main. All right. So the lowest level function we need to do for this assignment here is zeta again, right here. Here's the thing that we're trying to do. Uh, that's it. That's all you do for the assignment. You had a week to do it, and you're you're gonna sum up. The, uh, the prime counting function, pi is the prime counting function for whatever reason, uh, from i to j. So you're going to call the prime counting function multiple times and um, add the results together. And so at the very bottom tier is, is something a prime? Yes or no? So that is a bool, a bool true or false. I'm going to call it is prime. And I know the name is, is prime because that, that's what I figured out. It had to be in the previous uh, section. Oftentimes I come up with a, with a name that I later change. That's that's actually one way that I uh, I code is that I'll, I'll just guess a name. I, I don't know if I like the name or not, but 
I'll guess a name, and then later on when I start using it, I call it a different name, and then I'm really, I'm like, oh, that's actually the name. And so, is underscore prime is actually the name. Uh, you guys, since you're the second section, you get the benefit of better naming on variables, although x is still just x. So this function uh, will return true or false based on if x is prime or not. Okay. So. Uh, do, 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 do. So to test to see if something's a prime, a prime number is divisible only by one and itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to see if any number is uh, divisible up to x over two. Because uh, technically, square root of x is all you need to go up to, but x divided by two is good enough um, for our purposes today. And uh, so, like, we're going to see if ten is prime. Uh, we're going to start by uh, dividing by 2. If it's divisible by 2, it's not prime, right? And then, we're, uh, you know, well, 10 is a bad example. Um, uh, 35, right? So you, you divide 35 by 2. Nope, not divisible by 2. Divide by 3. Nope. Divisible by 4. Nope. Divisible by 5. Yes. Okay, it's not prime. So uh, for uh, we're going to try every number. So if that number is divisible by i, and I remember we're starting at two. If we start at one, it'll it'll say it's divisible. Um, you start at two. Um, no point to check if the number is divisible by one, right? If you start at one, you're gonna get a wrong number because everything's divisible by one. And you're gonna be like, yeah, it's on a prime. <laughs> you know. So uh, yes, yeah, so we start at two. And yeah, there, and there's better ways of writing this loop, but I'm, I'm not gonna worry about them now. Uh, so if it's divisible by the number, then we say it is not prime. If, if 3 divides into it, if 3 divides into 9, that's how you do it. Remainder function. If there's no remainder, it divides evenly into it. It's not prime. If it makes it through the whole for loop uh, without finding anyone, it is a prime. And now we're going to do drivers. So we're going to just see out uh, is prime 5. Eh, let's just do a for loop. Why not? For and i equals um, start with uh, if x is less than two, return false. Just pick up pick up zero and one that way. So for and i equals zero, i is less than twenty, i plus plus c out is prime. So we're just going to print out the result of this prime from 0 to 19 and just see if it looks right. Okay. Now, is this is this the final main? Is this going to be, is, is this reading in i and j? No, it's not. Main, main is a driver right now. All main is doing is just calling is prime a bunch of times and we're looking at the results and be like, does that look right? 2, 3, 4, oops, 5, 7, 11, 13. That's a problem right there. Okay. So, uh... So why is that? Why is that a problem? <clears throat> four, four is not prime, right? Yep. Very goodly. This needs to be less than or equal to x over two. Okay. And I think we can use square root of x here. It's, yep. Square root of x is not defined, so we shall hashtag include c math. Yeah, let's see here. Two is a prime, three is a prime, five is a prime, seven is a prime, eleven is a prime, thirteen is a prime, seventeen is a prime, nineteen is a prime. Looks pretty good to me. Let's just keep on going. Let's go up to fifty. And twenty-three, twenty-nine, thirty-one, thirty-seven, forty-one, forty-three, forty-seven. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We got an is prime function. So this is a driver. Uh, main is just a driver. It just tests our low level function while we develop. Eventually we finish with main and then we do all the main stuff last. Okay. So for bottom up coding, we start with the lowest level and we work our way up to main. All right. For now, it's just a driver for now. Okay. Next level up, prime counting function. So we're going to count how many primes there are between two, uh, between 
0 and x, right? So we need to write int prime counting function, or we just call it pi. Again, it's going to take x because I got no better the variable name than x. Um, and so this will um, return how many primes are less than or equal to x. Yep. And so this function is going to use is prime. So another for loop, for int i equals 0, mm, start with 2. We know that 0 and 1 are not prime. i is less than or equal to x, i plus plus. And we're going to have an int count. And so if is prime i, so if the number is a prime, we increment the count and return count. So there we go. Um, so we're going to count how many primes are less than or equal to x. We just start at 2 and go, go up to x, and every time we find a prime, we increment a count. We count how many there are, and when we're done, we return the count. Yep. Um, so rather than this driver, now we're going to do pi of x. And we'll do a lower count, I guess. Now we're testing the second function. There we go. So no primes, no primes. Uh, yeah. There's one prime less than or equal to two. There's two primes less than or equal to three. Two primes less than or equal to four. Three primes less than or equal to five. Okay, I see that. So, looks good to me. Okay. Um, so that worked. Uh, let's move up a level now. So now we're going to do the sigma. Um, and we're going to need a range of numbers from i to j. Sum up um, pi i to pi j. Okay. So we're going to sum you know, if we pass in 3 and 5, it'll add pi 3, pi 4, pi 5 together, and result, return the result. And sum equals 0. Um, for int i... I, I, whatever. I like having int i too much. Less than or equal to j, i plus plus. So starting at i i, I don't know. I got I got nothing. I got nothing better. Um, <laughs> all right, so it's gonna start at i i, go up to j, and we are just gonna say sum plus equals pi of i, and return sum. Okay. So this is going to um, uh, add up all the things, and now our driver is just going to do the sigma. And we're going to need a doubly nested for loop, because uh, we're, we're going to have multiple i's and j's. Um, mm -hmm, mm, See how I just keep my driver the same mostly because I'm, I'm just, I don't want to test it once or twice. I want to test it over a range. Like we found the, the bug with pi 4, right? So you want, you want to test it over a, a, a range of numbers and just kind of eyeball and make sure it works. Okay, so I don't like the formatting of this. Um, bo -bo 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 um, rather than an end line, I'm going to do a Some curly braces. Do a new line. So rather than a column of results, I'm going to get a table of results. Yeah, it's still a little bit too big. So let's start at two because 
Zero doesn't matter. All right. Uh, almost. Almost. Let's make it a little smaller even still. Just want it to all fit on the screen. There we go. There's a table of results. So the, the number of primes between 2 to 2 is 1. Right? So there's just 2. The number of primes, the, P, the prime counting function summed up between 2 and 3 is 3. Right? Because there's the prime counting function of 2 returns 1. The prime counting function of 3 returns 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. Um, and then it adds another 3. Uh, let's see. 2 to 4. So, uh, yeah, so that's 1 plus 2 plus 2 is 5. 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3 is 8. Um, these are, this whole bottom half here shouldn't be printed really. Uh, whatever. Not going to worry about it, we're just testing. Um, from 5 to 7, so 5 is 3, 6 is 3, 7 is 4. Four, so it's ten. Yeah, looks good to me. Okay, so that is looks correct. So let's do this. It's now right main. So we're done. We've we're reasonably confident the lower. There could be bugs in there. But we're, we're reasonably confident it's working. Uh, it's certainly going to overflow if the numbers get to be too big. Um, State Center Community College is calling me. Hang on to your hats. One second. All right, sorry about that. They were just telling me what the quarantine procedures were on campus. All right. So, um, so now we need to do main. So, and read and I equals read. Please enter I. L I P. J. So we're gonna read I and J. And then we're gonna do some error checking. This, this is this; these three lines of code would pick you up three points. Like, like I said, like there's no real reason to get a zero on an assignment. Like, even if you can't finish it, like just there's there's usually some some low level low hanging fruit you can just pick off some points. Like, I, I don't want you guys getting a zero because a zero is very dis discouraging. You know what I mean? Like, it, um, like you're ah, just drop the class. So there, there's always a possibility to just write three lines of code and pick up some points, you know. Um, somebody last uh, semester asked why I don't give partial credit for effort, and it's because in computer science, effort literally doesn't matter. In fact, it's usually better to have left, less effort, you know what I mean? Like, if you're working for an employer, if you can get a job done in 10 minutes rather than 10 days, that's better, you know? And what matters is if, if you can accomplish the task they need. You know, they, they, they assign you to compute the compound interest on a mortgage or whatever and come up with an amortization schedule. Um, better be right. <laughs> if not, you know, your company might lose billions of dollars. Um, you know, and so it's correctness that matters in computer science. It's not effort. Effort's neither here nor there. It's like, oh, you know, you know if, if I'm your manager and I see you work really hard, I might get you a cake or something, you know, but that's, that's about it. You know, it's the results that matter. So, um, all right. So yeah, test cases, the number of test cases you pass is literally your score, you know, because that's how much you've accomplished. You, you, you're given a goal and that, and the fraction of the goal that you achieve is, is what you get. So if you, uh, if you want to check your, your grades, by the way, um, type Alpine and it'll, it'll tell you, um, It'll tell you what you got on the, the assignment. The test cases that I grade you with are different from the test cases uh, posted in the directory. So if you hard coded any answers, uh, you're you probably got dinged on that as well. Okay, so some error checking. So if I is less than two, or j is less than two, or j is less than i, die. So we need to write a die function. Void die. See out. Batty, inputty, and quit with it. Error code, there we go. So die is done. Error check is done. That's three points. Um, okay. Uh, hard coding answers, didn't know that one. Yeah, no, I had I had one one student who would always just like look at the the input file, the output files, and just be like, all right, well, if the input is 
uh, six and seven, and then the output is twelve. You know, and it, it, he would just like just copy the output files. That, you know, I, I'm just like nope. So um, I'd give him, yeah, no points. Cheating basically. Uh, it's big brain. It, unless I change the actual grading test cases, then everything explodes on him. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, you turned off. Uh, yeah. So the optimizer for this assignment tripled your, your running time? Yeah. Yeah, so don't don't hard code. Don't hard code stuff. It's, uh, it's a <laughs> recipe for disaster. Alright. Uh, okay, so now we need to simply do the thing, right? So see out um, sigma ij. And the formatting obviously is not going to match up, but I, I don't care about that. So from two to three, the answer is three. From two to two, the answer is one. From three to three, the answer is two. From five to five, the answer is three. From five to ten, the answer is twenty-two. Lord, I can't do the math in my head. Um, let's see, from two to four, that's one plus two plus two is five. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. That's uh, that's the. Uh, that's the assignment. Okay. And uh, if I was in your shoes, I would make sure the strings match and things like that. Uh, in, in the break between the two sections, some students were like, I got a zero when I passed the test cases. And I'm like, but did you? You know, and, and it's because they didn't, they didn't type the strings properly and, and things like that. So it's always important to run input tester. Um, and and, and if, you, if you're getting knocked off just from like a, you misspelled something or something, just message me and I'll, I'll give you the points. I'm not... You know, I'm not a harsh professor. Um, it's not a big deal. Um, but that's why that's why input tester exists. Um, that'll tell you if you're passing the test cases or not. Right. So. so what you do is you run input tester, input tester, and that's what you want to see. Test pass, test pass, test pass. Uh, if it runs too long, it timed out. So you think probably got a 11 out of 10. So you got 10% extra. Okay. Um, and if you don't see test passed, then you gotta you gotta fix your code. Sometimes it's simple. You just have a typo. You said add with a capital A or something. I don't know. Sometimes it's just fix a string or something. Um, but a lot of times your logic is wrong or something like that. Okay. So that is Zeta top down, bottom up programming lecture. That's really what this assignment was about. And and uh, if you want to know how to optimize it, um, you should. There, there's a couple ways you can optimize it. First of all, you could you can make the observation that you're going to be checking to see if like the number two is prime over and over again, right? Like if you're if you're doing the sigma from like 100 to 200, you're going to check to see if the number two is prime 100 times. Right, and the number three is prime a hundred times. Like you're going to be repeating a massive amount of work, and so you can make a vector that just stores the results of if numbers are prime, or if you want to be a big brain, you store the um, the result of the prime counting function at every value. And if you want to be really big brain, you don't do any of that at all. My my function only has a single for loop, and what I do is I start with the prime counting function at i. And then I don't ever call the prime counting function again. I just move forward. If I start at 100 to 200, I do the prime counting function of 100. And then I check to see, is 101 prime? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, that's the prime counting function at 101 then is going to be one higher than the prime counting function at 100. Is 102 prime? Nope. Then it's the same as the prime counting function that I did last time. And so I just have a variable recalling what my last result from the prime counting function was. And as I go forward, I, it goes up every time I find a new prime. And that's it. I just have a variable and a for loop and one called the prime counting function. And the prime counting function itself, um, the prime counting function itself uh, doesn't start at zero because because I gave you the results of the prime counting function at all the powers of 10. So 10 to the zeroth power, 10 to the first power, 10 to the second power. And so if I'm asking you to count the prime, uh, 
if I'm asking you to compute the prime counting function at 100, the answer is 25. And so you can just look it up in the array. And then as you go forward through the array, is 101 prime? Yep, okay, well the result for the prime counting function at 101 is 26, it's one higher than 25. What about 102, is it prime? Nope. So its answer is 26 also. And as I go from 100 to 200, I'm just adding up all those numbers. And in order to tell if something is prime or not, I use the Miller-Robin function. Uh, this is why it's extra credit. I didn't require it, I didn't teach it. I wanted to see if you guys could look at documentation and figure out how to use it, okay? So if you Google the boost multi-precision Miller-Robin function, you'll see examples on how to use it. And also the uh, boost CPP int <coughs> uh, integer type is an infinite precision, infinite precision integer type. It can have numbers um, as big as can be. And so um, that if you use that, it won't overflow on you because the numbers on test cases 11 and 12 were so big, they wouldn't even fit into a long, long. And, um, and so basically this is kind of like checkpoints. So this is, uh, you know, this value here is the result of pi of 100. A pi of 100 is 25. The pi of 1,000 is 168. So you start at the checkpoint and then move forward from there. Um, so you don't have to start at zero and count all the primes up to 100 million, um, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million, 100 million. Um, the pi of 100 million is, you know, 5, 7, 6, 1, 4, 5. So if I ask you to count the number of uh, primes from 100 million to 100 million and 1,000, well, you just start there. You don't have to start from the beginning. They're pre-computed results. Could you go over the is prime function again? Um, okay. I didn't use it, by the way. I didn't use the is prime function. Miller Robin is a much, much faster uh, is prime function. It's super fast. Miller Robin can tell you if a number is prime without factoring it. This function here is factoring a prime number. That's what it's doing. So if, if I ask you, is 35 prime? What it does is it starts off by dividing 35, let's say we pass 35 in, we divide 35 by two. If the remainder is zero, that means two divides evenly into 35. That's what a remainder of zero means, right? When you get a remainder of zero, it divides evenly into it. So um, if 35 divides evenly into two, then it's not a prime and we return false, but it doesn't. 35 has a remainder of one. And so then we divide 35 by three. 35 divided by three has a remainder of uh, two. And so move on, 35 divided by four. Uh, that's uh, a remainder of three. No, nope. move on, 35 divided by five. Oh, that is a remainder of zero. That's not prime, return false. It's not a prime number. And so what we're doing here is we're searching for factors of um, 35. And this is actually a very inefficient way of finding prime numbers. There's actually a, um, a function called Miller-Robin, and there's also the Fermi's Little Theorem. There's other ways of doing it as well that can tell you if a function is probably prime without actually factoring it. Okay. Um, probably prime. So Miller-Robin uh, is 75% accurate. So if you run Miller-Robin and you pass in 35, um, if it says, well, it's 100% accurate if it's if it says no. So if you if you pass a number Miller-Robin and it says, nope, it's not prime, you are 100% guaranteed it's not prime. But if Miller-Robin, you pass the 35 and it says it is prime, there's a 75% chance it's right, there's a 25% chance you're wrong. And so you run it again on a different random number. You, you, you pass it, a, a, if you don't pass it a random number, it generates the random tests for you. So basically, when you do Miller-Robin, um, you run it 25 times. And since you have a 25% chance of being wrong, and you run it 25 times, uh, the odds of, of you being wrong is minuscule. And if you're worried about that, you can just run it more times. You can run it 50 times if you want. And, uh, and then your odds will be astronomically unlikely that you get anything wrong. So um, it's kind of cool though. It's kind of it's kind of a neat thing. It blew my mind the first time that uh, 
um, I heard about it, that you can tell if a number is prime without actually factoring it. And it's random. It might be right, might be wrong. <laughs> and so you just look up the documentation, and right here is how you call it. So you pass in the number you want to see if you're is prime. Pass in how many trials this, I would admit, I'd just leave it alone. Just pass in n and 25, and it'll tell you true or false. That's your is prime function. That code right there. Highlight. So close close parentheses, semicolon. You don't need the random number generator. If you don't, if you don't pass one in, use the Mersenne twister 19937. <laughs> anyway, so that's just extra fluff they have there. Alright. So uh, would you have a chance of failing the input tester? It's possible. It's possible. So use more trials if you're worried about it. And then lower the number of trials until you're still passing the test cases. No, if you want more speed. Uh, I, I tried 50 trials in 25 and I got the same result for both. So there you go. All right, so that is, uh, I haven't failed once with the miller Robin. Yeah, yeah, 10 to the negative 16th power is a very unlikely you know, thing. And remember, it's 100% accurate for composite numbers. It'll always tell you if it's composite. If, I mean, if it tells you it's composite, it's 100% accurate. If it tells you it's prime, it's 75% accurate. But you do that 25 times. And so you're, it's actually quite, quite reliable. Yep. All right. So uh, I noticed a few people figured that out. Bravo to you, well done. Uh, it was not necessary to complete the assignment. For the assignment, all you had to do was make three functions and structure them together in a clever, clever way. All right, so um, not even that clever, moderately clever. A loop within a loop within a loop is what we call an order in cubed algorithm. This is an extremely inefficient, this is a very bad way of writing code, but it's a good starting place to just get your points in, right? After you get your correctness, after you get your points in, then you look at optimizing it, right? So you might start with this and then work on, like, wait, like you make an observation, like, oh man, it's it's gonna be recompute if, if the number seven is a prime over and over again. Maybe I should write that down somewhere and, and just use a vector and look it up from the vector. Hmm, would that work? Could I use a vector to write down the results? I guess, yeah. And, and then, you, you know, you keep going over and going over it and you can reduce the number of loops from three down to one. So, get, so if you're, if you're doing a million numbers, this implementation here would do a million times a million times a million operations, which is a lot. <laughs> it's a pentillion, I don't know, it's some large number. Whereas my code would do a million, right? It's, it's the difference of this code overall is what we call order n cubed, this implementation. Uh, so n is how many numbers you're computing, and um, it's bad. So it's n, so if you're doing a million, it's a million times a million times a million. Whereas my implementation is order n. So it'd only do a million. Massive difference in speed, massive, massive difference. Would you have done this assignment using top down or bottom up? Um, I I've implemented it both ways, right? Uh, but when I did it for my own reference implementation, I did top down because I I like to start with the um, C outing stuff, like you know, please enter I, please enter J, just so that I have um, um, what's the best way of putting it. I I know what it's going to look like. You know, like I, I, I want the output to look reasonable to the students and I don't want to get too far in and not have like text that makes sense to the students. And that's, that's for example, why it only prints the output if there's 10 or less difference between I and J. Because I was spamming myself with like 100,000 numbers. And I'm like, uh, no, is, nah. So I, I, I typically start with the interface for that reason, but that's because I'm writing a homework assignment for students Either way is fine for me. I'm 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 as comfortable working bottom up as I am top down. Switch coding. Uh, all right. So that's that. I'm gonna stop the recording here, and then I'm gonna start another recording, and then uh, we're gonna talk about object-oriented programming, which is our new big topic. 
So just hang out for one second and let me stop this.